Hi everybody, this is Marlene with Erie News and today is December 27, 2023, Wednesday, December 27, 2023 and I want to wish my daughter Adrian a happy, happy birthday and uh, we're coming down, that's it, we're at the, basically the home stretch of the home stretch of 2023. So let's get on to our first story, which is out of Stranger Than Fiction Stories and it's titled something about the moon what is it about that moon that has so many countries seeking to land there after america first visited in 1969 on march 4 2022 a leftover piece of a chinese rocket that had been wandering in space for years hit the moon it impacted on the far side near the Hertzsprung crater first it was believed to be a piece of space x falcon 9 rocket sent to monitor weather in 2015. Later, it was confirmed it belonged to China's Chang 5T1, sent out in 2014 in order to test technology to be used to retrieve samples from the moon. China denied the rocket belonged to the space program, saying the, T- the 5T1 had burned up when re-entering Earth's atmosphere. The denial was later explained as a confusion between missions. In June 2022, the impact from the rocket created two overlapping craters. One measures 59 feet and the other spans 52.5 feet. In 2021, NASA issued a report that details that there are over 500,000 objects about the size of a marble that can damage satellites and about 26,000 pieces of junk about the size of a softball or larger orbiting the Earth. This is not the first piece of debris that has crashed into the moon. It's believed that in the future, junk in space should be better tracked. On June 6, 2023, China launched a new three-person crew to the space station. They plan to put astronauts on the moon before 2030. On August 23, 2023, India touched down on the moon's south pole. This was a second attempt after their first one failed four years before. A few days before, Russia crash landed in their own attempt. Their mission was named Luna 25. It was Russia's first attempt to land on the moon in decades since the Soviet Union fell. Both lunar landers were unmanned. The lunar South Pole has frozen water reserves, and the value in this is that it can be broken down into oxygen and hydrogen. This can be used as fuel to launch rockets to Mars without the pull of Earth's gravity. A few days later, Japan's first SLIM, or SLIM, lunar module was to be launched from the H-2A launch vehicle from Tanegashima Space Center. The lander is about the size of a food truck, and it brought along a bus-sized telescope. It also could have been the first launch since the failure of the new H-3 rocket in March 2023. It was canceled minutes before takeoff due to weather. There are others who believe India's claim of landing on the moon is all fake. First China and now India has successfully landed animations on the moons and in an upside down world you're expected to digest it all as fact despite precious little proof that these scientific accomplishments are real. And in the case of India's moon mission the animation on South Park is better. In other words, you know I asked myself after so many years like I think a lot of people have asked themselves why hasn't the United States ever returned to the moon? And it's very unusual that within months, years, very short time, all these multiple nations are landing, on, even, if, even if they're unmanned. And the most important thing is, I mean, besides the exploration part, why, why now the desire to go there unless what uh, it's mentioned here about what can be used as far as the... Uh, the 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 frozen water reserves i don't know i think uh, we'll follow up on this because this is very unusual why all of a sudden the moon has become so interesting anyway and you i'm sure you can hear by these noises this is the middle of the day over here where i'm recording and those are all my animals anyway on to the next story this is out of atlas obscura and it's titled how christmas murder mysteries became a uk holiday tradition in a family house besides a lock in Argyll, Scotland, just northwest of Glasgow, Andrina Cordani holds up the hard copy of her latest novel, The Twelve Days of Murder. The cover looks like it's wrapped as a Christmas present with red and gold baubles framing the title and the M of murder dripping down the page. 
The novel centers around a university reunion in a Scottish Glen where seven members of the school's murder mystery society come together to solve one final puzzle. Unsurprisingly, the gathering takes a dark turn when Lady Partridge is found dead hanging from a pear tree. The dead bodies quickly pile up from there. You don't want to know what happens to the French hen, says Cordani. As the night grows colder in the United Kingdom, so does the fiction. It's beginning to look a lot like murder, reads a sign in the Waterstones at Piccadilly Circus, Europe's largest bookshop. Among the tinsel and holiday decor, titles such as The Mistletoe Murder and Crimson Snow are set out to entice midwinter readers. These books are classic and modern whodunit mysteries set during the holidays. In recent years, these murderous tales littered with poisonous mince pies and corpses inside snowmen have become more popular than ever, and that, excuse me, than ever, especially in the United Kingdom. Christmas murder mysteries can be traced back to defective fiction's golden age between World War I and World War II. Before World War I, Christmas short stories and detective fiction have been steadily growing in popularity throughout Victorian and Edwardian Britain, eventually developing into the more complicated mysteries of the interwar period. Agatha Christie published her first novel, The Mysterious Affair at Stiles, in 1920, introducing her famed Belgian detective Hercule Poirot to the world. In 1938, following criticism that her murders were getting too refined, Christie published Hercule Poirot's Christmas. You yearn for a good violent murder with lots of blood, so this is your special story written for you. She wrote in the dedication. In the novel, Poirot is sent to investigate the unceremonious death of Simeon Lee, a tyrannical British millionaire, on Christmas Eve. Christie's holiday murder tale takes the Santa Claus murder published by the lesser-known author Mavis Doriel Hay in 1936. In Hay's story, Sir Osmond Melbury, a wealthy patriarch, is with his family when a guest dressed as Santa finds him shot dead on Christmas Day. Homicide and the holidays might seem an incongruous pairing, but Golden Age crime writing evokes a very festive kind of feeling for some, coziness. These Golden Age murder mystery novels and the modern books that follow their style are now often referred to collectively as cozy crime stories. It is likely that anxieties following the First World War led to a greater desire for the kind of escapism that crime fiction offers, where readers are greeted with puzzles and thrills in equal measure, says Johnny Davidson, editor of the British Library's Crime Classics series, a collection of republished Golden Age British detective fi fiction. Although they are varied and have adapted over the years, archetypical cozy crime mysteries are set in quintessential country houses and are rarely graphic. After an unexpected murder, readers race an eccentric detective or amateur sleuth to decipher his clues and find the killer amongst a close circle of suspects who are known to each other and possibly related. The butler, maid, and gardener accepted. Littered with levity, humor, and relatable characters, the stories culminate in a grand reveal that unmasks the murderer. While some are darker than others, readers sitting safely by their firesides at Christmas can be assured that good mostly triumphs over evil. Between World War I and II, Christie and fellow British writers formed the Detection Club, an exclusive and quirky writers group that published its own mysteries. After World War II, the style continued, but some began to stereotype the genre as twee. Soon, grittier psychological thrillers replaced cozy crime stories. However, in the last decade, cozy crime alongside thrillers has grown more popular than ever, particularly at Christmas. The reason for the revival is open to debate, says Martin Edwards, the author of more than 20 crime fiction novels and the nonfiction book, The Golden Age of Murder, which examines the origins of the genre. Edwards has been tracking down out-of-print and unpublished mysteries for years, working with the British Library to republish them. Christmas murder mysteries have done particularly well in the United Kingdom. Now you go into a bookshop at Christmas and you can't move for books with snow and bodies, he says. Edward stresses that the use of atmospheric vintage covers has been key to the republished book's success. It helps that many of the republished stories are short and easy to binge over the holidays, but they also offer readers an insight into a turbulent time in history, which may feel familiar today. The original Golden Age writers were writing about a very interesting time, says Edward, who disputes their coziness, pointing to the genre's darker works and historical value. In the 1920s, it was a reaction to the horrors of the First World War. 
In the 30s, there's the economic slump and economic tensions, he says. Is it that life today seems weirdly reminiscent of life in the 30s, with all its uncertainties? When the British Library published J. Jefferson Farjian's Mystery in White, A Christmas Crime Story in 2014, it became a bestseller. From then on, the librarian Edwards have brought out Christmas crime novels and anthologies of republished mysteries with fearfully festive names. This year, it's Who Killed Father Christmas and other seasoned mysteries, including a 1980s murder mystery where Santa is murdered in a busy London toy shop. The intellectual challenge of cozy crime makes the genre particularly attractive to readers at Christmas. For Simon Lee, a law professor at Ashton University who moonlights as a murder mystery writer, the stories are about fact-finding and how to deal with conflicting evidence, he says. At one level, you're reading it for enjoyment, and at another, you're seeing if you can solve the mystery before the writer tells you the answer. Lee, who published his own festive whodunit, the first lockdown Christmas mystery, thinks the holiday season is the perfect setting for murder mystery, and has encouraged his law students to write their own death-dealing tales over winter break. At Christmas, there are plenty of traditions to play on, and it's easy to imagine a group of people stuck inside for long periods, possibly snowed in. As tensions and spirits rise, a cozy crime setup may start to feel familiar. The nearest most of us come to that is at Christmas, he says. For good or ill, you end up with extended family and you often feel like killing them. These days, not all Christmas murders take place in quaint English villages, and not all authors or characters are white and middle class, a common criticism of the genre. Crime fiction, like most of the publishing industry, frankly, was dominated for a century or more by middle-class, largely male writers, with the exception of several very prominent Golden Age crime writers like Agatha Christie and Dorothy L. Sayers. Okay, uh, says Vasim Khan, author and chair of the Crime Writers Association, which supports authors and host awards. He sets his murder mystery series in modern historical India, and his short stories involve one of his favorite Christ Christmas themes, Killing Off Santa. The, popular, the current popularity of crime fiction cuts across countries, continents, and cultures, he says, with the industry making efforts to match readers' demands for more diversity. I've seen a genuine and concerted attempt by most actors across the publishing industry that means agents, editors, publishers, and marketers, bloggers, events, organizer, to move that dial. Like Professor Lee, Khan finds that the best Christmas murder mysteries offer a challenge and are thought-provoking, but they're also based on the reality of family holidays. You've got these seeding things going on under the surface. Crime fiction takes that one step further. You bump someone off, normally we'll just have a fight at Christmas, a sulk, and not speak to each other for a year. At their heart, Christmas murder mysteries are morality tales, he says. Using the holidays and an endearing detective to highlight the good and bad in human nature as we head towards a new year. Writing cozy crime mysteries, including those set in the holidays, has become so popular in recent years that others, along with the rest of the Crime Writers Association, has introduced the Who Done It Dagger, an award for cozy crime stories. According to the CWA's website, the award goes to a tale that has a clever intellectual challenge at the heart of a good mystery and revolves around quirky characters. The CWA's Twisted Dagger Award for psychological and suspense thrillers has launched as well, reflecting the two biggest selling crime genres today. The popularity of murder mysteries has also made its way to the screen. In the United Kingdom, it wouldn't be Christmas without an Agatha Christie adaptation. This year, it's the two-part Murder is Easy. And also across the nations, hotels, restaurants, and even castles are booked out for Christmas-themed murder mystery events in high numbers. Emerson... Sam Emerson is a creative director of Moonstone's Murder Mysteries, a murder mystery events company. He writes the scripts, runs the show, and hires actors to entertain guests who play detectives for the evening. We've lost a dead body before, says recalling a performance where an actor playing the victim misheard a direction, leading a hundred guests to scour a hotel only to find him lying in the grass outside. <laughs> Emerson's company offers two Christmas mysteries, Murder by the Mistletoe, which is set at a 1920s coaching inn and winter wonderland. Their bestseller takes place in a modern-day garden center grotto where Mrs. Claus has been found with a string of Christmas lights around her neck. Uh oh, Christmas is huge because of Christmas parties. We've got God knows how many winter wonderlands going out this year. For crime author Cordani, the tongue-in-cheek humor of Christmas murder mysteries isn't just about laughs. It's critical to the genre. The whole point 
of the midwinter holidays to remind us that there is still light. She says, even as the bodies pile up in Cordani's at 12 days of murder, there's still a lightheartedness to the big, to the story reminding readers that the good days will come back. By the way, prior to this, Christmas time was, in the UK especially, it was the favorite time. And even here in, you know, in the United States, it was, it was a time to for ghost stories. Like, and I think I've stayed, you know, everybody thinks about uh, Halloween, but no, usually it was, it was the, um, like the same thing, the fireplace, the coziness. This was the time to basically sit around the fire and listen to ghost stories. There was a lot of ghost stories written around that, that tradition of somebody retelling either something they experienced or something that was told to them. Next story is out of Stranger Than Fiction Stories and is titled The Betrayer. John Morgan was only 22 years old when he took a hatchet and killed three persons that had treated him like family. By the way, this isn't a cozy mystery. It's not cozy. It's not a mystery. It was real life. It's, it's factual. This is 1897 West Virginia. Chloe or Chloe Kuntz married Frances Marion Faust and had eight children, five girls and three boys. The youngest Matilda, Tilly, was only two years old when her father died in 1873. Chloe Faust remarried two years later. Her second husband was Edward H. Green, who was 28 years older than her. He had lost his wife the year before, and he had seven children by her. He would have, he would have another son with Chloe named James. So they had, what, like 15 kids plus one between them. Yippee. Chloe Foss Green's husbands were not meant to outlive her. Edward Green died in 1895 at the age of 90. Three years before, she had lost her daughter, Sarah Foss Whiting, who was 28 years old. Chloe kept living at the Foss Farm in Jackson County, West Virginia. Her three children, Matilda, Nancy, Alice, and James, lived with her. The Foss Green family were known for helping others and were well-liked in their community. They took John Ferguson Morgan into their home when he was 16 years old. It was said by the newspapers that in his early youth he had been neglected by his parents who were indifferent people. He was an illegitimate orphan whose mother died when he was about nine years old and since then he had wandered from home to home. At the Green Farm he was treated like a family member and he lived with them until 1896 when he married Rebecca Hall and moved to a farm located less than a mile away. Chloe Green helped John by giving him work and making sure he could feed his family. She gave him a horse which he traded for two younger ones. He took out a lien against the horses, and when the bill came due, he could not pay it. His solution to the dilemma was attacking his benefactress and her children. The week before the attack, Chloe Green was expecting money for a horse she had sold. John Morgan came to the house unexpectedly at 1 a.m. and asked James if they had received the money. Even though it was an odd question, James told him they expected it the next day. The family was concerned that John would try to steal the money, and mention was made to neighbors about their suspicions. A week later, John Morgan came to the house on November 2nd and asked Matilda to cut his hair. Since night had fallen, she said she would do it properly the next day. On November 3rd, 1897, very early in the morning, James went to feed the hogs. John followed him and crushed his skull with a mattock. This is a farm tool shaped like a pickaxe. The others were in the house and were unaware of what happened. John returned, and when they asked where James was, he said that he left to check traps. Chloe and her daughters knew this answer could not be true, since James had brought the traps home the day before. Though they were suspicious, Chloe went, back, went to the back of the house to make the beds. Nancy, Alice, and Matilda thought it strange that James had not returned to the house, despite Morgan's explanation. They asked John about this as they were making breakfast, and he tried to change the subject. Suddenly, he struck Matilda twice in the head with a hatchet. He then hit Alice on top of the head. The wound penetrated her brain, and she fell to the floor. Matilda regained her feet and ran out the door. Morgan went after her. Despite her wound, Alice got up and ran out of the kitchen through a closet into the sitting room and then to the porch. Then she saw Morgan coming down the passageway into the sitting room. Matilda was later found dead in this room. Chloe Green was still in the bedroom with the door closed. Morgan broke the door down. She tried to run away through the house while he attacked her with a hatchet. She was found lying with her feet on the edge of the porch and her body on the ground with four wounds in her head. Alice hid behind some boards and then in a corner of the hen house. 
Still bleeding, she made her way through the cornfields, hearing her mother and sister screaming. Despite her sister calling for her to return, she kept running to a neighbor named John Chancy. Her cries brought him from the house, and she told him what happened. Soon people arrived and found Chloe and Matilda alive but unconscious and lying in a pool of blood. James was dead in the hog pen. Chloe and Matilda would die from their injuries. The murder weapon was found a distance from the house in a garden by Mr. Chancy's house, leading one to believe that Morgan had followed Alice when she fled. By 10 a.m., 600 people were at the farm. G.W. Shamblin spotted John Morgan, and he was pursued along with other members of the community. He gave up and was arrested. Another version of his capture was that he was caught in a store at Walton. It was after dark, and he went to buy tobacco when Constable John Camp happened to be in the store and recognized him. He covered him with a revolver, and he was shackled and guarded until morning. It was said Morgan was in mortal terror of being lynched. Morgan pled not guilty and appeared to care nothing for his crime. The first witness was Nancy Alice Faust, and her testimony was consistent with what was known. It was clarified he carried an axe and not a club. Morgan said he killed his victims in self-defense. It took the jury less than an hour to return a verdict of murder in the first degree without recommendation, which meant he would be sentenced to death. During the proceedings, it was clarified that his true surname was Rains. His mother kept house for a man named Morgan, of whom his father became jealous and killed him, for which he was killed by Morgan's family members. It seemed that John's biological father, Marion Rains, was plotting to kill Morgan when his son was still a baby and had a reputation as a, as a sadistic man. Why his mother would use the surname of a man she worked for is unknown. When John Morgan was six years old, he was sent to live with the Daly family. Mrs. Daly went to another part of the house, leaving Morgan in another room with her young child. Suddenly the baby screamed and she rushed back to find Morgan astride the baby with a knife ready to cut his throat. He was sent home. During his last confession, Morgan implicated a man named Ben Anderson, who he said helped him with the murder of the Green family. He said that Nancy Alice was in, was in love with him, and he planned to kill her. Mothers said they could get the property and live together. His lack of remorse and willingness to implicate innocent persons in his crime deepened the belief in his degeneracy. During the time he was waiting for his execution, he cried while pacing inside the cell. Then other times he laughed and joked. The rope that was used for the execution had been used to hang three other men before. It was made of fine silk and hemp. He escaped from jail days before the hanging by fooling the jailer. However, he was quickly recaptured. He was executed on December 16, 1897 in Fair Plain, Jackson County, Virginia, approximately 45 days after the crime. There was so much outcry and attendance by the surrounding communities that his execution was the last public one to be held in West Virginia. From then on, executions were carried out inside Moundsville Penitentiary. Burial was refused for John Morgan by his father-in-law, Hiram Hall, and likewise by the trustees of the cemetery at Fair Plains. Burial was finally made on the land of N.U.G. Shin, brother of the sheriff. The remains lay in the coffin overnight inside the cell occupied by Morgan when alive. Nancy Alice Foss died in 1944 at the age of 75. She carried a scar resulting from the wound on her head to her grave. She had outlived all her siblings. They are all buried at Falls Green Cemetery in Jackson County, West Virginia. Morgan's, John Morgan's wife, Rebecca, and their son, Albert Thorne, stopped using the surname of Morgan and only used her maiden name of Hall or Morgan Hall. The following is a story told by someone whose family went to live at the Falls Green Farm. Quote, the house our grandmother was born in was the site of a grisly murder that resulted in the last public hanging in West Virginia history. The murderer was John F. Morgan, who took an axe and violently massacred the widow Green and her three children. The purpose of her story is not those horrible murders, but what happened after. After John Morgan's execution on December 16, 1897, the old greenhouse stood vacant for several years as the stories and legends about the greenhouse spread from town to town across Jackson County. My great-grandmother Minnie and great-grandfather Leander were well aware of the history of that old house before they moved in during the autumn of 1900. They had two children, Dorothy and Leonard, and Minnie was pregnant with my grandma, Belle. Despite the stories of the grisly murders, Leander and Minnie were in a tough situation 
as a fire had all but destroyed their home in nearby Ravenswood. Besides, they felt the children were too young to understand what had happened in that house, and they were both people of strong religious beliefs. They were not concerned with a few hinds or other manifestations. However, they could not have expected what they would go through in their new home. The house had been vacant now for nearly three years and needed a good deal of work to be made livable. The wood floor in the kitchen still had the blood stains that covered about a ten-foot area where Mrs. Green had crawled to the back door after John Morgan had attacked her. She died there on the kitchen floor. Morgan chased the three children out the back door and killed them in the backyard. A neighbor had seen Morgan leave the house, and when questioned by the authorities, he confessed to the murders. After Morgan's subsequent hanging, the case was deemed closed, and the house was left virtually the way it was the morning of the murders. Leander and Minnie were able to make the house livable in a couple of weeks, but they could not get the blood off the kitchen floor. They scrubbed and scrubbed, but the stains would fade, then come back. They tried to lie, to no avail. They tried lie, but to no avail. They tried standing down the floor, and the stains came back. They tried painting the floor, and the stains came back through the brown paint. Even the local Ripley newspaper came out and did a story on the bleeding floor. Eventually, Leander decided to replace the wood in the kitchen floor, but to his astonishment, just a few weeks after putting in the new floor, the bloodstains again appeared on the floor. The strange occurrences were beginning to take their toll on Leander and Minnie as they began to hear the apparent moans of Mrs. Green and the low cries of the murdered children. They decided it would be too difficult on their own children to remain in that house, so they decided that as soon as Grandma Bell was born, they would leave the house. Giving up on ever being able to remove the bloodstains from the kitchen floor, and figuring they would only be there another few months at the most, Leander placed a thick tweed rug over the biggest part of the bloodstains. In April of 1901, Grandma Bell was born, and that May the family had found another house and were packing up for the move when Leander made a horrifying discovery. As he began to roll up the huge tweed rug, he discovered the bottom of the rug was saturated with blood. Needless to say, Leander and Minnie left the rug and left the house that night. The county owned the old house and decided to destroy it rather than to continually answer questions about the greenhouse and the bleeding floor. Still to this day, you can hear noises and even drive by and see the old forgotten graveyard. And there you go. And for those of you watching the video, this is this is uh, Marion Foss. This was, you know, Mrs. Chloe, Chloe's first husband that she had all the other children. And this is John Morgan getting hung, executed. And I'm t- talk about swift justice. And this is the this is where Morgan lived, about a mile away. This house actually belonged to the Green family, and they kind of, um, you know, they let him live there close by. So even as an adult, and even after he was married, he was benefiting from his relationship, and he really uh, he betrayed them all. He killed them. And this is his wife, Rebecca Hall Morgan, with her son Albert, who was a baby. So yeah, and. You know what, this part where, when he's six years old, because I guess, remember, this might be out in the country, and maybe there wasn't, either there was orphanages, or maybe the families felt bad for him, and he would just go live at different households, but this part where the Daly family finds him straddling their baby with a knife when he's only six years old, that's that's very frightening right there, that that's either a child, well, no, that is a child that's deeply disturbed and probably either psychopathic or who knows what was wrong you know, or what he had witnessed or experienced by the time he was that young. So, let's go on to the other story. The next story is out of the Greek Reporter, and it's titled, Alexander the Great's Tomb is Located in Greece, Sorbonne Historian Claims. Apparently, which I wasn't aware of, his, uh, the tomb of Alexander the Great has never been located. Alexander the Great died in 323 BC in Babylon, and the tomb was directed to return to the kingdom of Macedonia and Greece. However, it is said that Ptolemy I Soter, one of Alexander's four main generals, intercepted the tomb and placed it in Alexandria. Since then, there have been many theories as if it was moved, as to where it was moved. Archaeologists have searched but have not yet found the tomb of Alexander and the direction begins to shift back to Virginia, Greece. The location of Alexander the Great's tomb was and is one of the most sought-after archaeological questions that has developed into various theories. Most historians argue primarily only using textual evidence, and archaeologists 
mostly anthropological clues. Thus, many theories have emerged. World-renowned University of Sorbonne historian Helen Glatzi Arweiler, in a recent interview, argued that the tomb of Alexander the Great is most likely in Virginia, Greece. Arweiler argues the tomb excavated by Manolis and Jonikos and identified with Philip II of Macedon is in fact Alexander's. This diverts from the popular opinion of the tomb being in Alexandria. In King Philip's tomb, a haunting depiction is found on the pediment with Alexander the Great in the middle. However, there are two more interesting details found in the Philip II's alleged tomb. In the deathbed, the images of a satyr, a male deity, and a Greek god Dionysus are found. For the connection to the satyr, R. Weiler relates the story, conquering a Phoenician capital Tyre, of Alexander. During his exp extensive campaigns, Alexander encountered formidable resistance when he arrived in Tyre. In a moment of doubt, Alexander, according to legend, dreamed of a satyr. As an Aristelian, he saw this as an omen, a play on words in ancient Greek where a satyrs sounds like Tyros is yours. This encouraged Alexander to stay and successfully capture Tyre. In the context of Alexander's life, the significance of Greek god Dionysus and satyr imagery is profound. Dionysus was not only a wine deity, but also a symbol of the divide between civilization and the wild embodying the spirit of conquest and change. The satyr, who was frequently associated with Dionysus, represented unbridled nature and freedom. These images on the tomb may represent Alexander's dual nature as a civilizer and a conqueror, as a man who straddled the known and unknown worlds. Therefore, according to R. Weiler, the two images of satyr and Dionysus discovered in the Macedonian tomb are more related to Alexander's story than to King Philip's. When Alexander, having conquered much of the known world sought deification, the story takes an intriguing turn. He demanded that the Greeks acknowledge him as a god. The Spartans agreed without hesitation, but the Athenians debated the proposal. Demades, an Alexander friend and prominent Athenian orator, proposed making Alexander the 13th Olympian deity. Outraged, the Athenians fined Demades. His response, he who grasps the heavens loses the earth, alluded to the dangers of overachievement. Fearing Alexander's wrath, the Athenians eventually caved, agreeing to worship him as Dionysus. The famous Cynic philosopher Diogenes remarked sarcastically, If you make him Dionysus, make me Serapis, another deity known for syncretic qualities combining aspects of Greek and Eastern divinities. This is not the first time R. Weiler discusses the location of Alexander's tomb in her work, Alexander the Great of the Byzantines, our Wilder seeks to answer the riddle of Alexander's tomb. She notes that the tomb with a leg injury similar to that sustained by Philip II gave credibility to her theory. I'm sorry, let me go back here. She notes that the findings of American anthropologists who discovered a skeleton near the tomb with a leg injury similar to that sustained by Philip II gave credibility to her theory. Furthermore, this skeleton did not fit the armor discovered in the tomb, which closely resembled the armor worn by Alexander at the Battle of Gua Guacamela, as depicted in the famous Pompeii mosaic. Even more surprisingly, traces of a mineral known as cryoscola were discovered on the skeleton, a substance used in Egyptian mummification, complicating the mystery even further. Glatzi R. Weiler also mentioned Lucian's writing in her book, which speculate on Alexander's desire to see the stories written about him after his death and the intense power struggles among his successors. This historical context emphasizes the period uncertainty and the possibility that the location of Alexander's tomb, tomb is still unknown. The mystery surrounding Alexander the Great's final resting place remains unsolved, with Helen Gleitsky R. Weiler's theory points to Greece as a possible location. Her research combines the anthropological findings and historical analysis, adding a new element to this age-old quest. Despite compelling arguments, the exact location of Alexander's tomb has not been determined by historians or archaeologists, leaving room for further investigation and discovery in this fascinating chapter of history. And you know what I think is really funny? <laughs> I... I'm I'm checking this because I believe Alexander the Great died of something. Of course, when he was uh, very young, uh, but it was something simple. Okay, uh, okay, Alexander the Great. That basically he he died of like from West with the equivalent of West Nile my virus, uh, West Nile virus or encephalitis. 
then he was what? Uh, that he died mysteriously at the age of 32. Okay. My point being uh, is that he's here, he's trying to get deified and become an Olympian god, you know, and and he's thinking he was, he was, uh, he thought of himself not an ordinary man and a god. And uh, I think he found out that he was very ordinary uh, when he died that way. <laughs> so it's like, you know, that, that saying about a legend in his own mind. I mean, yes, he was a great general and whatever, but yeah. Anyway, let's keep on in the ancient world. We're back to Stranger Than Fiction stories, and this is titled The Fate of the Legio 9 Hispana. In June 2023, it was announced that a silver military medal with a Medusa motif was found in what was once the northern edge of the Roman Empire in Britain, could have belonged to an ill-fated member of the Ninth Legion. The snake-covered medal dates back approximately 1,800 years. It was unearthed on June 6, 2023, at the archaeological site Vindolanda. This was the site of a Roman auxiliary built fort built around 100 AD, about 20 years before the construction of Hadrian's Wall. The falera, or a mili- which was a military decoration, was found under a barrack floor. The motif is Medusa, which is mostly known in the Greek story where Perseus beheads her while she sleeps by using Athena's shield as a mirror. The Medusa, also known as Gorga, was one of three Gorgons. They were described as winged female human females with snakes growing from their head instead of hair and looking into their eyes would turn a person into stone. However, by Roman times, Medusa's image was used to repel evil and to stop bad things from happening to the wearer. The snake-haired image has been found on Roman-era tombs, villas, and battle armor. Alexander the Great was pictured in a first-century mosaic with a Medusa on his breastplate. The phalerae were awarded for valor in battle, and they would be worn with a strap. Most medals are found in burials. Around the time the wearer of this phalerae lost his medal, the Legio IX Hispana, or the Ninth Spanish Legion, had already fought in Britain and various provinces throughout the Roman Empire. It was one of the oldest and most feared units in the Roman army. The Ninth Legion fought in the siege of Asculum in 90 BC. In 65 BC, Pompey raised them to march in campaigns from Gaul to Africa, Sicily to Spain, and Germania inferior to Britannia. Upon becoming governor of Cispaline, Cisalpine, Gaul, in 58 BC, Julius Caesar had four legions that were already based there. They were the 7th, the 8th, the 9th, and the 10th. Caesar disbanded them after his final victory and settled the veterans in Picernome, which is modern-day Abruzzo, Italy. After Caesar's murder, there was an attempt to recreate the 7th, the 8th, and the 9th legion, but it wasn't until Octavian took power that he recalled the veterans of the 9th to fight in the Balkans, where they received the title Macedonica. They battled against Sextus Pompeius in Sicily in 35 BC. Octavian then used them in other battles, including the Battle of Actium against Mark Anthony in 31 BC. In Hispania, Terraconesis, sorry, which is Spain, they battled the Cantabrians, and this was from 25 to 19 BC. This is when the name Hispana was attached to the legion. In 43 AD, they most likely participated in the invasion of Britain. In 61 AD, they suffered a defeat in the rebellion of Boudica. Most of the foot soldiers were killed and only the cavalry escaped. In 71 AD, they battled the Brigantes and constructed a fortress at Eboracum, which is York. Ten years later, they were under the command of Agricola for the invasion of Caledonia, which is Scotland. The last activity for the Ninth in Britain was found recorded in a stone tablet discovered in 1864 where they were rebuilding the legendary, the legionary fortress at York. The legion mysteriously disappeared from Roman records after 120 AD without explanation of what happened to them. The fate of the men has been well researched, but without a definitive conclusion of what befell the legion, it was theorized they were defeated to the man around 108 AD in Northern Britain. However, There were other mentions made of the Ninth Hispana at Nimegen, which is the Netherlands, around 120 AD. There's even a possibility they were destroyed sometime in 200 AD. The only certain fact is that the Ninth Hispana did not exist during the reign of the Emperor Septimus Severus. At this time, there were 33 legions, and two different lists of legions do not have them recorded. In the 1990s, a silver-plated phalera with Liege Hispan Ninth 
was found at a fortress on the lower Rhine River dating to 104 to 120 AD. An altar to Apollo from the same time period found at Aachen, Germany, makes reference to Lucius Latinus Macer as chief centurion and prefect of the camp of Ninth Hispana. He had built the altar in fulfillment of a vow. What is not clear is whether the entire legion or only a detachment was at the Netherlands. Scholars believe that the presence of a senior officer like Maester indicated the whole legion was there. With uncertain information available, the traditional theory was that the Ninth met their fate on the frontier against the Celtic tribes. Possibly a revolt of the Briganti soon after 108 AD was the battle that decimated the legion. One factor that goes against this theory is that two senior officers who were deputy commanders of the Ninth Circa 100, on the Ninth Circa 120 lived on for many years afterwards. In other words, even after that, in 120 AD, there's reference to these deputy commanders. In 1866, a Roman bronze casting of an eagle dated to the 1st or 2nd century AD was found in South Chester, Hampshire, England, during an excavation of a Roman basilica. It was hollowed inside, measured six inches in height, but was damaged, and the wings were missing. The feet were curved, and it's theorized it was grasping a globe held by a statue of Jupiter. Rosemary Sutcliffe, author of The Eagle of the Ninth, created her story based on the disappearance of the Ninth Legion and the discovery of the Selchester Eagle. The movie The Eagle in 2011 was based on her novel. The demise of the Legion, which numbered 5,000 of Rome's finest soldiers, is argued to have happened either in northern Britain or in the east of the Roman Empire. There are several wars that could account for the end of the Ninth Legion. In 132, the Romans fought the Second Jewish Revolt in Judea, and some believe this is when the Ninth ceased to exist. Perhaps it wasn't destruction, but an act of attrition which ended the Ninth. Veterans aged out beyond the time they could be recalled. Or maybe the answer is much more mysterious than originally suspected. In 1963, a construction engineer found a small hoard of coins while excavating the north bank of the Ohio River during construction of the Sherman Minton Bridge for Interstate Highway 64 at the Falls of the Ohio. The coins were grouped as though they had originally been in a leather pouch that had long since disintegrated. As author David Brody explained in his book Romerica, issued in 2020, quote, Scores of Roman-era coins, artifacts, and fortifications have been found across New England and the Ohio River Valley. They didn't just swim across the Atlantic on their own, of course. Most of them seem to date back to the 2nd century AD, around the same time that the Roman Ninth Legion, originally stationed in Great Britain, disappeared from history after deploying to Jerusalem to put down the Bar Koba uprising. Did members of the Roman Ninth Legion journey to America in the 2nd century? If so, is it possible they brought with them some of the lost temple treasures? Interesting, huh? That's a whole different spin, because you have to understand, which I wasn't really familiar until I started to read up on this. The worth of these uh, legions was the more experienced the forces were, the, the more effective. That's In other words, that's why he even recalled veterans, because even if they were older, once, in other words, if they survived all these attacks, they were considered more lethal, for lack of a better word, as far as uh, the quality of the soldiers that you were going to have go with you wherever you know you wanted to take them. Uh, then, the, the I thought this was really interesting. The next story is out of the BBC, okay? And it's titled, Alex Batty, teen from Oldham, missing for six years, found in France. The reason why I bring this up is, you know, usually when especially a child or a young person goes missing, everybody thinks, yeah, I know sometimes they run away, but in this case, you always think they died. And sometimes this is why there's always hope. Um, Alex Batty is at a young person's center in Toulouse and could be back in the UK within hours, the prosecutor's office in the city told the BBC. By the way, this is dated December 14th, which is maybe less than a week ago. Alex used a motorist phone to message his grandmother in the UK saying, I love you, I want to come home. He had been missing since 2017, but was found on Wednesday morning by the motorist who spotted him walking through rain near Toulouse. The boy disappeared after going on holiday with his mother and grandfather in Spain. The pair, who do not have parental guardianship of Alex, have not been located, but remain wanted in connection with his disappearance. 
A police source earlier told BBC News the boy had been taken to a police station by the concerned motorist who had spotted him on a road in the foothills of the Pyrenees early on Wednesday morning. The motorist delivery driver Fabian Asidini saw Alex walking along a road in the foothills of the Pyrenees in the early hours of Wednesday morning. He explained that he had been walking for four days, that he set off from a place in the mountains, though he didn't say where, Mr. Asadini said. I typed his name into the internet and saw that he was being looked for, he said. Mr. Asadini told local media Alex's plan had been to find a big city with an embassy to find assistance. Instead, Mr. Asadini contacted French authorities for help. Alex used Mr. Asadini's Facebook account to contact his grandmother back in the UK. He wrote, Hello, Grandma. It's me, Alex. I'm in France, Toulouse. I really hope that you receive this message. I love you. I want to come home. The boy said he had been in France for two years, the police source said, adding that he bore resemblance to the last known picture of Alex. He had been living in the remote Pyrenean, Pyrenean valleys, traveling about from place to place in a kind of itinerant commune. The area in the foothills of the Pyrenees is known for attracting people in search of alternative lifestyles. Alex won't say where his mother is or exactly where he had been living in the Pyrenees, the prosecutor's office told the BBC. His grandmother and legal guardian, Susan Karuna, told newspapers she had now been in touch with Alex. I'm so happy I have spoken to him and he is well, she said. It is such a shock. Miss Karuna told the BBC in 2018 that she believed Alex's mother, Melanie Batty, and grandfather, David Batty, had taken him to live with a spiritual community in Morocco. She said at the time they were seeking an alternate lifestyle and did not want Alex to go to school. Melanie and David Batty left Greater Manchester with Alex for a pre-agreed weekend, week-long holiday to Marbella in Spain on the September 30th, 2017. He was last seen at the port of Malaga on October the 8th that year, the day they were expected to return to the UK. British police were contacted via the UK embassy in Paris. Greater Manchester police confirmed it was in touch with French authorities to put safeguarding measures in place. This is a complex and long-running investigation, and we need to make further inquiries, as well as putting appropriate safeguarding measures in place, a spokesperson said. In a statement, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office said, we are supporting a British national in France, and we are in contact with local authorities. And you know, you know what they leave out here? Let me see. It's like, why was he under the guardianship of his grandmother and not his own mother? And I take it, you know, I don't know if this is the paternal grandfather or the maternal grandfather and the mom. This is very weird. And this is a follow-up. This is like four year, four days ago. And um, yeah, basically they're saying that British police officers will accompany the boy on a flight from France. You know, obviously, um, Alex is believed to have been living a nomadic lifestyle in spiritual communities with his mother and grandfather for the past few years. French officials said he decided to leave when his mother wanted to go to Finland. Alex is believed to have walked through the mountainous terrain of southern France for four days before being found by a delivery driver in the middle of the night. The driver, Fabian Asadini, said he lent the teenager his phone. Miss Karuna who is the teenager's legal guardian based in Oldham, said she can't wait to be reunited with him. I cannot begin to express my relief and happiness that Alex has been found safe and well, she said in a statement. Okay. She requested privacy for the family so that they could make his return as comforting as possible. Uh, locals said Alex had been staying at a guest house there on and off for the past two years. They said he was living with his grandfather who did odd jobs in the area and his mother was in the neighboring region. The residents added, while his French wasn't great, he was always polite. French police said Alex told him his grandfather died, ah, there, about six months ago. Three locals, however, have told the BBC his grandfather was seen alive as recently as last week. Let me tell you. This is very weird. I, I, I want to follow up on this because it's like, his mother, is this his maternal grandmother? Like, why was this child taken, as a very young child, because remember, Six years ago, he was not even a teenager. Why would he be in the custody of his grandmother versus his own mother? And I, this is the part I don't understand. They they take him, 
and they should have just let him go back and be with his grandmother instead of living this nomadic lifestyle and his mother sounds like a real cuckoo bird if you know what I mean yep a real cuckoo bird and unfortunately that's not a good thing for children so anyway guys I hope you like this uh, last group of eerie stories and for all of you out there Merry Christmas Merry Christmas and Happy New Year we're coming up on it fast till next time